Hello, everybody. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here today. Uh, without exaggeration, with a, such a distinguished audience, and uh, uh, definitely uh, doing uh, some presentation after the lunch is the worst thing to do. So I will try to not be very boring. Uh, to be honest, I had a, a, a different idea of presentation today, uh, but after attending several lectures, I changed my mind. So I will not be talking about the boring macro figures, and I will not be talking how great and cool is Central Bank of Georgia, given that everybody knows that. So uh, basically my presentation today, and I will call it more discussion, is about idea why uh, bureaucracies all around the world are so resistant to make different decisions. And the story that I want to tell you uh, basically shows that not really much has changed for the many decades in the past. Uh, the story that uh, I brought with me, I heard it first time uh, from Professor Tushman in Harvard Business School, and then I did some research, and I think it's a really amazing story. So I will jump to it so that you also have the chance to relax a little bit after the lunch, as I told you. So basically, uh, in USA, early 20th century, uh, end of 19th century, everything is going fine. It's an era of uh, economic growth. Uh, railways are constructed, roads are built, economy is doing fine, huge immigration wave to the United States, new, new opportunities, new land, uh, people all, all over the world are trying to go for, for American dream. And that, uh, in that time, uh, U.S. Navy, one of the most significant and uh, very well organized public institution, um, to that time, already the U.S. took over of the world leadership from the United Kingdom uh, and total leadership in the sea. So basically, U.S. Navy in that time is not uh, is winning all the battles. is a very successful organization, and there is this guy called uh, Lieutenant Sims uh, serving in the U.S. Navy. And what's particular about this guy? is that this is a kind of person who has uh, different ideas every day. He has thousands and thousands of ideas that he wants to carry out. We all know this kind of persons around us. And many times he is quite annoying. So the decisions that U.S. Navy administration does is they are so annoyed that they send him to serve on the battleship in the South China Sea. So it's basically the most distant point from the US Navy head office. So the guy is serving on the battleship and thinking about other ideas. And the idea that, he, that comes to his mind uh, is following. So to that time, the battle, the the ships are equipped with this kind of uh, with this kind of um, weapon, and basically how the battle takes place is that ships uh, approach each other and they shoot from this this uh, this gun, but the problem is that the accuracy of this machine to that that time is um, guess how much. 5%. So basically, only five, uh, five uh, shootings hit the target out of 100. And uh, in general, uh, we can say that what this cannon does is the only thing it does is just makes noise and smoke. And in reality, the real battle takes place, what's called uh, abordage. So basically, after they all shoot each other and they miss each other, then ships approach each other and go on abordage. And this is how it feels. Uh, just uh, actually, my presentation is all about this kind of picture. So. 
And this is how, how it looks like, just for the illustration. And uh, Lieutenant Sim starts to think why the accuracy rate is so low and what can be done. And the idea that comes to, uh, and the, the observation that he makes basically is that accuracy rate is so low because of the waves that uh, basically aim cannot be fixed. So he comes up with the idea, that's not the exact uh, prototype definitely, but he, he comes up with the idea to put the cannon on the basement, which basically will move against the wave and will fix the, uh, the cannon itself. After testing his invention, the result he gets, the accuracy rate, jumps to 90%. So it's a very, very significant, uh, very significant uh, observation and invention he makes. He is extremely happy, uh, documents everything, and sends his invention to the head office back to the Navy administration in Maryland, if I'm not mistaken. And waits when he will be called uh, to equip all the ships with this, uh, with this uh, invention. And uh, in several weeks, the uh, answer comes back. And guess what? The answer is negative. They just reject it. He sends back the letter again. So trying to uh, trying to explain how important it is that how much it will influence the battle that the mortality rate which was very high during that time in the battle will go down and so on and so on the second answer comes that we are not interested and he keeps sending letters and and the US Navy administration keeps rejecting this idea Remember the movie Shawshank Redemption when, uh, when the guy is writing the letters into the library to get the books, something like that. And basically here is the whole idea that I want to go now and pursue in detail. But before I go in detail, I would uh, welcome your uh, involvement a lot. Any ideas why US Navy is rejecting this, this invention? They don't want it's a status quo, but why? It's a, it's a great invention. I mean, it, it gets the accuracy from 5% to 90. It's very simple uh, in terms of the financial point. It's uh, liable, feasible, please. You have to produce less ammunition. If you get the accuracy, then you have to shoot less, and you have to produce less ammunition. So you think it's a lobby of the ammunition people who produces that? Yeah, please. So the organization is very conservative. They don't want any innovations and new things. Uh, but at the same time, again, I, I, I want to stress the fact that it's not from 5 to 7% or from 5 to 20%. We're talking about very, very good invention, which basically changes everything. Yeah, but why? Please? Would this, the implementation of this idea mean that they would need fewer people in the Navy and then maybe they don't want to have fewer people in the Navy and they want to preserve the... So, uh, so the idea is that it, 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 will, it will be resulted in this in reduction of the people serving and there is a lobby that goes basically on one. Yeah, definitely the fear of change as the status quo syndrome takes place, but at the same time, again, we are talking about the U.S. Navy, which, um, uh, I mean, uh, they are smart people. I think so. They are, right? Yeah, please. Maybe it's also about the budget that they receive, so the reduction of the funds that they receive from uh, uh, the central... So the financial feasibility is, is a matter. Maybe <laughs> Of the 
Okay, to, uh, to go on, uh, I'll add one detail to, to make something clearer. So the guy sent so many letters that they invite finally him back to the head office to test the invention. And when they, they arrange the test shooting, they arrange it on the land, which does not make any sense at all. So they test it, they examine it on the land and say, oh no, it's, it's not working. De de definitely, yeah, definitely that's a factor because being, it's the hard toughest is when you are successful. I mean, when you are close to go bankrupt, you are seeking for new things to survive. When you are successful, definitely you don't want to change anything. Um, okay, to, to, go, to go on, um, uh, any last idea and then I'll go or I should jump. To, to the decision. Upper dash is not necessary. <laughs> okay. In order, in order to understand uh, what is the rationale and the, what is the basis behind rejecting such an obvious nice thing, we should dig a little bit in detail who takes the decision and how the decisions are made. So, who are the people serving in the head office of the U.S. Navy? So these are the retired captains of the battleships. And uh, these are people highly appreciated, highly respected. They, they are extremely successful. And basically, what makes them successful and what, what makes these people, what they are, uh, what, what they are, their major pride of their, uh, the reason of their pride is how many ships they took on abordage, how brave they were, and so on and so on. And on the battleship, on the other hand, the main guard is the captain, and the brave people who basically go hand to hand fight. If they take this thing on the equipment, if they equip this uh, the battleship with this invention, what means is who becomes who becomes the main guy on the battleship? The the the, the, the shooters who were nobody. Before. I mean, they were. They had exactly no function before, except of making noise. But what's more important is the guy, not who has a, uh, power and bravery and can basically uh, do different uh, things with his sword, but the guy who studied geometry well, right? So the guy who is basically who will be uh, telling everybody where to stop the ship, how to aim, and so on and so on. And the, basically the idea is that so yes, definitely everything is gonna change. Why it's gonna change? It's gonna change uh, because the whole strategy of the US Navy at that time is about approaching how to do the abordage, from which part to go, and so on and so on. And abordage becomes non, uh, basically not needed anymore at all. Because uh, if you have this kind of accuracy, and if you, you, you have the right locations, and basically what uh, uh, it, it's all about sinking the opponent's uh, battleship, right? So this small invention basically changes the whole strategy, everything. The strategy or development of the uh, battles, the naval battles, it changes who is the boss on the ship, it changes every single Every single, um, every single detail. And people in charge of that, who should make that decision, they don't need it. Because it changes the whole understanding of their way how things should work. And here is a major point. How things, how, how we should uh, 
we should address the issue, and from my experience, to understand why these kind of ideas are very often rejected. And I'll give plenty of examples. It's not only US Navy and it's not only public sector. Uh, I'll give later on a lot of examples from the private sector. We all know this, uh, this uh, chart. This is, uh, if, if we want to understand how the decision making is made, we just uh, go and try to find the formal organizational structure of any organization, whether it be public or private. And we know who is the boss and we know how, how things are and basically what the Lieutenant Sims was trying to do. He was trying basically to, to identify the guy, but all these people, all the generals, all these retired captains, they are all against him. Now, if we go in more detail in the, any organization, basically, we start to find out that, yes, formal organizational structures do matter, how the decision making formally is produced, but if we go in a little bit more detail, we see that in any formal organizational structure, there are people who influence each other a little bit more despite the positions they have in the hierarchy. Now, if we want to understand how the decisions are made even in more detail, and if we dig in more detail, we'll end up with this kind of thing. And this is informal organizational structures, the informal information systems that, that exist in every single company, big, small, private, or public. And the idea of the informal uh, organizational system is that it's not obvious, it, just knowing who is in charge of making decisions does not mean anything. In order to get our decisions carried out, we need to understand how the decisions are made itself. And it's also obvious then when uh, head of department or CEO or whoever is making decisions, he is influenced by other people. And very often, opinion makers in any organization, they are not formally in charge of any, uh, any departments. And basically, these opinion makers, and we can see that the opinion major opinion makers in any organization is, in, in our case, is 59, 52, uh, well, some other guys also. And this creates corporate culture in private, uh, private companies. And this creates political culture in public sector. Now, what's important in all this and why I'm bringing this topic? Because in order to, in order to implement your idea and to be successful, the one thing that we definitely need, we need allies. Because nothing can be carried out without allies. Now, we start to think and we, we need to, to, to involve the stakeholders, we need to involve the people who will support our idea. Because in our case, what Lieutenant Sims was doing, he was just following the formal path of decision making, and he was, for the reasons that we basically already discussed, he was, he was not successful. Now, let's imagine I have some idea that I want to carry out, and uh, I'm interested whether how good is this idea, and I call for a beer or coffee, the guy in any organization who is 90, basically. Like we, I call him, we go have a beer, I tell him the idea, he says that's a brilliant idea, and the story is over. Because 90 can do nothing about that. Right? What we definitely need, we need the allies, we need those people who are making the corporate culture, and corporate culture, as it's famously said, its organizational structure for a breakfast. It's much more important to understand how informal decision making takes place and who influences the decisions rather than just see the chart, right? So we want the 59, we want the 52, we want, I don't know, more active people to be on our side. Now, who can be these people? That's also very important, right? Who can be the people who we should involve and who can be those people who Lieutenant Sims should have addressed? They may be inside the organization and they may be the outside. In, in, in case of Lieutenant Sims, I would imagine that would be 
uh, somebody in charge of decreasing the mortality rate, right? So basically, after this invention, the mortality uh, rate in the, during the battles will go down significantly. So definitely, this is a person who, is in, uh, who, who would be major ally in this case. But in, in all the different fields, when you are extremely successful, as you have correctly mentioned, it's very hard to, to innovate, and it's very hard to make changes on one hand, and it's very hard to promote the ideas on the second. Now, smart managers and smart uh, leaders of any particular organization know their organization on this level. We all know who these people are, right? I mean, 59, 52, or 19, it's not necessarily that they are, uh, they are on high level positions. They are just opinion makers, they are leaders, they are extroverts, they are people who influence other, other people, and so on and so on. What organizational leaders, the biggest mistakes that usually they do is that everybody wants 59, 52, and 90 to have on board, right? So if I am a CEO of a company, or, for you, or I am a minister, or whatever, and I want these people to be on my board, the biggest mistake in my experience uh, that they make, they take this 59 and promote him to the official position. And this is a big mistake. Because as soon as you promote 59 and 52 to the formal director position or any position, he becomes part of the formal organizational structure and immediately he loses his position here because he has to carry out the decision according to the procedures, rules, and so on and so on. So understanding from both, stand of, from both points of view, from the points of view of uh, CEO and the policymaker, what's going on in informal way in the organization, and understanding, understanding that we need allies and we need to understand very clearly how things are organized is very, very important. Now, I, I'm sure that if we, uh, if we just uh, make a small, uh, small, if we take a minute and think about our organizations, uh, we'll, and, uh, we'll identify these people for sure, right? In any organization, we will we'll, we'll identify these people. So in order to, to implement your idea and to, to implement any particular idea, again, it doesn't really matter in public or private sector in, in, in this case, uh, what we really need to understand who influences whom and how the decisions are uh, made, how the corporate culture is organized on the governmental level, on the, on the private sector level, and so on and so on. Now, I'll give the example of the central bank and how we try to use these kind of things, but before, the, before I, before I uh, jump on other examples, if you have any comment or idea so far, so I want just to make sure that we are on the same page. Definitely. In no way we, uh, we approach other people and try to neglect who are officially in charge. What we want to make sure, we want to make sure to have right people on board, those people who will be influencing the decision which ultimately must be made by the formal leaders. We, we need to understand, uh, I, I understand the point. My, my personal experience is that uh, we need to understand that informal organizational structures will exist whether or not we want it. People will communicate behind the official structures in any case. Now, in a good sense of this word, try to, uh, in a good sense, I, I don't know how it can be good, but kind of try to, uh, I don't know what English word to use, uh, to, to, to bribe this guy or to seduce this guy, to 
motivate, I don't know. It, it can be done in different methods. But the decisions, but the idea to put this guy to the formal, to, to make the formal him the formal decision maker will not solve this problem. Because there will be the new guy, new opinion makers coming up, you're basically coming up again and again and again. Um, let, let me give you examples of private companies, a huge amount of private companies who failed being the most successful companies at that time, uh, at, at, at that point of time. So the number one company that comes to my mind is Nokia. This is a company five years ago, the most successful mobile company in the world, with the highest uh, share, market share, a lot of cash, the smartest people working there, and suddenly on the street, and suddenly there is a new technology coming up, which is basically the idea of computer in the phone, the smartphone idea. So these people sit and think, you know, the idea to get computer in your phone will not live. And our strategy to make the phones smaller is the right, right strategy. And they just reject the idea of the smartphones. What happens afterwards? Within four years of time, the most successful company goes bankrupt. It's just they're trying to come back again. And the Apple and uh, Samsung takes the market share and they are far ahead today. Given that if the managers of Nokia would took that on, on uh, and, and it's not the case they didn't know what was happening. They, they, they knew perfectly what was happening. Another example that I can bring is uh, the famous company Kodak. They, uh, which were producing the, uh, the uh, photos, or the, the cameras, photo cameras. Uh, they are uh, accidentally located uh, in, uh, they were located in Rochester, uh, upstate New York. Uh, this is a place where I went to high school, so this is a whole city basically was, uh, was around this, this place. What happens with Kodak, a very successful company, extremely successful leader in uh, uh, producing the photo, pho photo cameras, but they were producing it on a, uh, on, on, a, on a film. So the digital technology comes in, people gather again, these formal guys, and they say, somebody says, you know, maybe we should do some more research in the digital because it's, it's something is happening there. What's the decision they make? They make decision, photographing is about film. There is no digital technology which will ever substitute film. What happens? The company which used to employ 50,000 people is non-existent within a matter of years. Uh, Encyclopedia Britannica, one of the most successful written edition, uh, where a lot of people were working on it, very successful, uh, very successful company again. What happens, Wikipedia is coming on, people sit again and say, how come Wikipedia can compete with us? It's not even uh, checked information, it's not even reliable, it's open source, uh, everybody puts whatever they want to put. Within several years, within several years again, they just go west again. And we see that over and over and over again. And it's not only the story of uh, early 20th century. We see that all over the place. What changes a lot is basically that now things are happening really quickly. And making changes and making innovations is just the part of our everyday life. We are working in an environment um, when I'm sure in a few years we, we, we get back home and our refrigerator will be talking with our TV, uh, discussing what, what, what's going next. And uh, sometimes now I'm getting back to the Georgian, uh, Georgian uh, reality, Sometimes when, 
when we witness what is a major subject of discussion amongst the policymakers, it's really a pity because the world is in a different place. They think about extremely different things. And we are thinking about absolutely different things. We are thinking how to increase the agriculture and you know, uh, how to subsidize it. We are living in a country, uh, we are living in a country which is the least urbanized country in Europe, the least urbanized country in Europe. And instead of thinking how to end our secondary education uh, really sucks. Uh, it's like 70th place among the 75 countries uh, in terms of the math skills uh, and you know you know this is a thing. And instead of thinking how to get this education, how to get the innovation, how to get this all happening around us, how to address the issues that we want second, third, fourth, fifth cities, we are seeking how to how, how to get people not leave the uh, countryside. So what I'm what I'm trying to say, I'm trying to well, what I'm trying to say is that uh, if we uh, don't get, uh, yeah, there's, there's uh, other examples that 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 we had. This is a musical industry, basically. It's a fun, fun, fun example. Also, before I go to the before I go to the discussion part. Uh, See, the, you, you're, this is a music industry, right? With the uh, eight tracks, this vinyl is uh, also. You all know what is it? Don't, 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 don't let make me explain it. Cassette, CDs, and basically, I'm sure that none of us has bought the CD, musical CD, for the last five years, and now it's all digital. And behind this chart are the bankrupted companies who were resistant to innovate. And behind these companies are a lot of people who made the wrong decisions, and behind these companies are people who did not realize how important it is to change and how hard it is to change. Uh, now, we, we often have uh, and this, this idea of uh, changes that take place, this is not something new. And this is a famous quote of Charles Darwin that those pieces that survive, not the most intelligent, but most responsive to change. Not the strongest one, not the most, in the, if it was in a different way, then the elephant would be running the, uh, would be running the world and not the people, right? So. We may have a brilliant idea, we may have a brilliant project, but it may be rejected if we don't really get a sense in every particular field how this, not who is making decisions, but how the decisions are made. So two things that I, uh, I want, uh, I want and what the aim of my, uh, my presentation today is that we really think that for how important it is to change in the first case and how important it is to innovate on a daily basis. At second, just writing a letter, I have this brilliant idea, we should do it, does not really make any sense. Or we should not be surprised if we see the rejection of the policymaker on the idea that we think is brilliant. Now to get to the uh, Central bank experience, I will just bring one um, real life experience, my own experience. Uh, we, want, we are in a process to, uh, to implement the uh, electronic signatures all over the banking system. So we are basically trying to eliminate all the paper, all the paper uh, from the banking system and just to, to have the smart pads where everything will be done. So there are two, two ways to do it. One way is that I call the CEO of the bank, tell him, tell him here is a project, very nice one, it's cost efficient, it's tomorrow, uh, that, that's what's going to happen. Uh, we don't need these papers anymore. When client comes to the bank, it reduces the serving time. It's, 
uh, makes you more effective and so on and so on, go do it. So all the CEOs of the bank will tell me, definitely, let's do it. And there's one sitting there, so just smiling. You know what's going to happen next? The CEOs will go back, they will ask the formal committee, they'll get back to their formal structure, or the organizational structure, they get the people, the head of IT, head of security, head of operations, head of logistics, there will be this committee and the CEO will say, you know, the central bank, they come up with a new idea about these e-signatures. What do you think we should do? And what will be the reply? Head of IT will say, I need to double check that because, you know, that's a privacy issue. Maybe there is something hidden behind that. Maybe there is a conspiracy. They want to look at particular accounts. I need time. Yeah. As the, as the head of operations, which is very powerful and influential in the organization, because he is in charge of organizing all these paperwork, all these archives, all these operations. And the, he or she has everything well organized. And everybody admires her, everybody appreciates her. Why she would want to make the e-signature implementation project which will basically change the whole job description and everything that she is so good at. And I'm sure that every single guy in this formal organizational structure, when the CEO will call them, would call them, will say, we need time to understand what it's all about. They will take time, they'll get back in two weeks, with a big presentations in a, in a good good case, uh, and they'll say, no, we, we are not ready yet, I need to double check that, blah, 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 and basically this project will be screwed. Even though formally, I approach, and we approach in a very right way. Who is in charge? I tell the, I tell the person in charge, then he calls this formal structure, and so on and so on. But, because we know how things work, we didn't do that. What we did, we called the people who are in charge of those operations that will be eliminated. So those people who will be forming the biggest opinion against implementing this new project. So we called the guys not in charge of the formal decision making, but we called exactly the persons who in our understanding will be doing their best to kill the project. We call them, first we do our presentation, we tell them what you think about this, how it's gonna work, we make them feel the ownership of the project, we take the ideas they, 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 uh, they uh, want us to take, then we try to find out who else can be the, uh, our, uh, our uh, biggest allies, in case of one of the banks who was first to implement, it turned out that their corporate strategy is also about being green, and basically elimination of paper is also uh, in line with their major strategy, so we immediately have the allies who are in favor of this idea. So we spend a little bit more time working below the formal and behind the formal organizational structure. Then we call the CEOs, tell them that this is the idea we have, then CEOs go back, they gather all these people, and guess what, half of them already know what it's about. Half of them have the ownership of that idea. Half of them are already our allies. And they take the leadership, they take the ownership of the project, and the chances the project will go on is much, much higher. So, not to make your uh, too much tired. Here I'm gonna I'm gonna stop. Okay, let's have the Darwin here. And uh, I invite to you to have the comments and your ideas about your experience. I'm also very interested in any questions. I mean you can ask the questions about the macroeconomy also, but <laughs> Mm -hmm. We 
they are they were first and the second numbers missing. Uh, on purpose or which one? Uh, yeah. This one. This one. Yeah. You don't have your first and second number. You have you start with three, four. Yeah, well, yeah, because the first one I mean the CEO and the deputy CEO and. The, you don't see the heads of departments here because they have the job descriptions, they have a lot of work, they have procedures to carry out, and they do it in a way the, the decision making tree is organized. And uh, the second question would be the people you, you identify as the, as the opinion makers, the 52 59, isn't this automatically, automatically so that they are automatically promoted in, uh, in, in, this, in the organization? If they can uh, change the opinion, if they have influence on the opinion, is, doesn't it happen automatically that they are being promoted to the higher positions? I think, um, Even if they are uh, both professionally skillful, I mean, you must be extremely lucky if you have the leader of the company, CEO of the company at the same time, the most extrovert guy, the opinion maker, everybody loves him, he's doing a great job, but in reality, um, even if we promote 52, we have the, an, uh, somebody else who will be forming the new opinion. In case of Georgian reforms, and I will bring the reform of the education, and uh, uh, those, uh, I mean, uh, those of you who, uh, who remember that, the reform in education was extremely, extremely unpopular to that time. Uh, we are told it was a very corrupt, I mean, I will just have two words that we had extremely corrupt uh, system of uh, getting to the higher education, and basically we deleted the whole procedures of getting of the exam procedures to the higher education, and we had this national combined exam. But if you remember, huge amount of people were opposing that. And I think, and now, I mean, everybody loves that, but to that time it was... It costed a lot of political rating. And I think the failures at times that, uh, I mean, why we, we could have done much better if we could have identified who is opposing us. I understand that in many cases you cannot get the professor who is in charge of taking the, taking the exam uh, on your side, but at least you spend more time in communication and you spend more time explaining people that those people oppose it and it's normal they oppose it because these people are the guys who lose their power, who lose their influence and who lose basically what was before. And uh, what we did, we said, no, that's true, that's how it should be done and that will be carried out. And we carried it out, but uh, uh, I think that identifying and identifying the allies, identifying, talking more to the parents, talking more to the people who would have support and promote the opinion making would make a difference in terms of the, in terms of the uh, political, uh, political uh, dividends also. And one more thing, I mean, just like in the successful companies, uh, what I note is that successful governments when their ratings are high, they don't change too much, exactly for the same reason. Usually they start to change when the ratings go down, because if you struggle for survival, then definitely you need to come up with something new. And I think the key to the success is to innovate and be uh, responsive to change exactly when you are on the top, exactly when you are the most uh, successful in, in, in that term. Any other comments and ideas? You, you know, in, in, the, in, capital, uh, in, in capitalism, you know, there's famous savings that uh, companies will go bankrupt anyways. 
Uh, capitalism without bankruptcy, it's like uh, Christianity without uh, hell, right? I mean, if you don't have hell, the idea of Christianity disappears. So you don't have the bankruptcy, uh, the idea of capitalism will disappear, definitely. The companies will go bankrupt. But we want to make sure we are not the ones who go bankrupt, right? So we want to make sure that we are the successful ones. And uh, if we look back at the most successful companies, uh, and again, it's tens of them. Those are the companies when they were not responsive to the changes when they were on the top. When you are on the bottom, yeah, either you change or you just don't survive. That's pretty simple. But the idea is that, again, from both sides, we are here we are mixing two things, right? I mean, not mixing, but combining. The idea of innovation from the standpoint of policymaker and the idea of promoting successfully your idea from the standpoint of, uh, of the author of the idea. So this is both important in both ways because the audience here is uh, on one way the uh, policymaker and on the other hand maybe the uh, author of any project in a bigger sense. That's, that's why I'm kind of mixing that. Yes, uh, and what happened to the lieutenant seems that how was his innovation finally, uh, obviously, uh, used and implemented? And uh, that's, 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 I, I'm very glad that you asked that. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll conclude the story with that. Uh, if there are no, no other questions, I want to finalize with answer with that. Okay, I'll get back to that one. Uh, one question. We're discussing today about the Georgian Stock Exchange and uh, where it uh, should be going. Uh, what's your opinion on that? What's your idea? And the pension reform that they Now, now the, the problem is that you are, uh, you, 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 are, you are asking the formally the regulator of the sector. Um, but before, but because, uh, but because uh, uh, my term expires in a month, uh, I can be relatively straightforward. Uh, I, I think it's, it's not going to work uh, in the next 10 years at least. And there is two reasons why it's not going to work, in my opinion. First, with the development of technologies, the idea of the stock market in a small economies is, uh, is something, um, something really controversial. A, because if I want to invest as a consumer and as an investor, I can open the brokerage account in my smartphone and trade in New York or London right now, right, right here, from right here. So why I would trade in a small, uh, in a small market with a small liquidity. Secondly, uh, if the company is big enough and good enough, the liquidity premium in the big stock exchanges are so much higher that I don't understand how it will work in a small market. Now, the idea to create the pension system and or in other way to create the artificial demand side in a small economy which will originate from the taxpayers money which means the basically deducting the, you know, decreasing the consumption, right? I mean, if I pay more taxes, I consume less. And then this artificially try to boost it. I don't know. I'm interested in your view. Uh, what is that made Georgia successful in reforms? And uh, whether Georgian experience can be implemented in Ukrainian Um I think... Uh, <coughs> I think that uh, we were extremely lucky because uh, what happened is that after the Rose Revolution, uh, when the young, uh, uh, young leaders came to power, uh, they had a big public support, huge public support, and it was a fashion to reform. So it was so unpopular to resist to changes. And there was this mood to, to change really quickly. 
that it was a major recipe for the, for the reforms. Uh, if you do it slowly, and if you lose the popular support by that time, these people who are resistant to that, they'll get stronger and stronger and stronger, and in real life they'll try to discredit every single, every single initiative. And if you don't do it quick enough, then uh, you basically uh, are very close to failure. Now, a lot of things, uh, I mean, I'm really uh, proud that we do have the ambition in this country to say that on the regional wise and the bigger stance, uh, we are the least corrupt country. I mean, we are not rich country. I mean, when, we, when we say about, when we talk about the success of our reforms, I mean, Sometimes people try to compare that how now you are rich again, now look at the figures. We're not a rich country. It's a different thing. The idea is that in terms of the government services, fighting corruption, liberalizing the, liberalizing the, um, as a uh, business environment, fiscal discipline, monetary discipline, um, all these uh, things, uh, government services again, and uh, Justice House, which is, uh, and uh, Nino, former head of Justice House is here. Uh, all these government services and uh, I mean, electronizing all this thing, I mean, we do, we, we really are proud of that. And it's impossible not to be proud of that. And I think even uh, change of government through elections is also another reason to be proud. Because you don't see too many countries in this region where government is changed through elections. So yes, definitely, we did a big step forward. It was a huge amount of failures. It's impossible not to have the failures when you do these kind of things. But um, at the end of the day, now what we need is we need the sta second stage of reforms. We need, we need, uh, I mean, uh, we we do have the structural problem, and the problem of our our economy. Now to get to the economy itself is that. As I told you, uh, in 21st century, the, uh, the only resource is, as Margaret Thatcher uh, mentioned uh, way uh, decades ago, is uh, educated free manpower. Educated free manpower is the only resource that makes things, uh, that, that can produce value added goods and make the country rich. Now, when we get back to Georgia, we don't have educated, uh, educated manpower. We, our 50,000 of our teenagers graduated from high, grad, are graduating from high school every year, not having close enough skills to understand how things work. Then they go to the higher education. We have problems there too. And then we have this huge amount of young people who, who meant to be extremely productive, they graduate from, high school, from universities and they are not even close to what they should be in terms of the uh, education, in terms of the skills, in terms of understanding how things work. And then we are expecting from these people to, to produce goods and services which are compatible worldwide. So uh, here I think to have the big jump, we need to import the know-how and we need to import the technologies. Before we fix the educational system, which is a long and quite a, and here also I think I'm on the higher education system, I will just say it's the last word and uh, I don't want to, to use the time. I think here we are, I was uh, five years ago when I was thinking what can be done with the higher education, it's so expensive that uh, I was really pessimistic. But now again with the technological change, with the internet era that we are living in, now with the Stanford, Harvard, MIT, the best schools, putting their online, con their content, educational content, content online. Higher education have been never so accessible as today. What we need, we need to pay, we need to uh, uh, spend a lot of money as much as we can in the secondary educational system so that A, our teenagers are English spoken, that's extremely important, and B, they have skills to, to work and to get the data from the, from the internet. It still will require time, but before we do that, we need to import this, uh, the, the human resource. And there's nothing bad about importing the human resource. I think, 
if you go through the whole ages of the successful, successful and fastly developed world, it's about importing the importing the intellectual um, people and importing the manpower. I mean, United States is all about that at the end of the day, right? It builds a system where it consistently imports, I mean, it has one of the best uh, educational system in the world, definitely. I mean, 85 universe, best universities out of 200 are, um, of, in top 100 are from US, but it also imports everybody all over the world. We need to do the same. We need to open up the borders. We need to invite everybody that we can. Now, why we are not doing that, that's another topic, and I can talk about that for weeks, so I want to talk about why, that. Why? I'm sure it will. I'm sure it will, uh, and I, I actually, the, uh, uh, it, it, Ukraine, in some sense, is much ahead than Georgia was, because uh, Ukraine is a big country, and there are people there, there are resources there. Resources there are much more available than in Georgia. Let me give you the comparison. You have very good IT schools. You have very good IT people, which are crucially important. Uh, and uh, average salary, comparable salary, and I had some research in this field, comparable salary of IT people in Ukraine and Georgia is, uh, it costs five times less, five times less in Ukraine than in Georgia. So th there are resources there, definitely. And two, Okay, I'll just finalize and then I'll just listen to you, Kitten. So. Uh, you, you know, uh, my my understanding uh, how things work. Again, we are talk We are uh, in a world of big data. Things that are happening around us, we still don't don't really realize what the internet era is all about and this, uh, the, the energy prices and we, we had these panels and so on and so on. And here, this is a slide basically and this is, uh, this is a penetration, penetration uh, of different inventions and the years it took. Okay? So we see that it took 100 years to, to get the uh, telephone, electricity. I mean, when electricity was invented, nobody really had a clue how to use it. It was only used for the uh, lightning purpose. Only it took quite a years when the companies realized that they can use it as a productivity tool and, and basically exchange these big spaces and machines with the electricity-driven equipment. When we talk about the internet, we still have no clue well, we do have clues that it's a big thing, but I am sure that, at least I think that we are in a very, very different era. We are in an era of, and I bring my favorite example, uh, Amazon. Amazon identifies whether or not their client got pregnant in three weeks. He, coming from the evaluating the searching pattern of a, of a, a woman. I mean, when the woman gets pregnant, so far only woman at this point. <laughs> That's going to change also. I, think. I, I, I know the women will like that remark. But. So uh, basically when, when, when women get pregnant, their searching pattern uh, changes and uh, big data and the IT solutions so Amazon recognize that and they do this, this individual targeting immediately. And uh, we are talking about the Google uh, capacity when this virus was spread out, virus was spread out, this H1N1, N1H1 virus was spread out. You know that what Google did, they, uh, they processed 450 million transactions and came up with this algorithm uh, that they could basically online predict the sources of epidemic around the world. So basically when people 
got some symptoms, they were searching with a particular words. And then Google was evaluating all this and they were providing online data. And they were four weeks ahead of uh, WHO and so on and so on. What I'm trying to say is when we talk about the priorities, why I bring these examples is that, you know, the in marketing, for instance, the books that were issued 15 years ago, I mean, reading this, in my understanding, is just, it's, it's just uh, wasting your time. And we are, we, we are living in such a quickly changing world that it will come by itself. What we need to make sure is we need to make sure that our teenagers, our population is equipped with the knowledge and skills and they're going to do whatever they, they do. And I, I don't think that classical, you know, because we are on this geography or because, I mean, uh, we are wine producing or not producing country. I mean, that's a different topic. Anyways, I, if I continue with this, I can talk for a week, definitely. So I don't want to talk for a week um, unless you want, but uh, I will tell you the end of that story. You know that United States is, is all about the happy end. <laughs> and of course, uh, is the story also has a happy end. And the happy end is that uh, this guy, Lieutenant Sims, he was uh, extremely disappointed and he was uh, uh, really close to do, uh, basically, uh, he had these suicidal ideas and so on and so on. And finally, he basically wrote a letter to the President of the United States, uh, that time Teddy Roosevelt. And uh, he wrote this whole idea, uh, how it is and so on, so on and so on, but it's not that simple. When somebody writes a letter to the President, what, what they do, how it's processed is, basically they just write, for instance, somebody writes to the Central Bank, I reject, then this person goes, writes to the President, and the President sends a letter to me for the of the actions, right? That's how the flow is. But the uh, Lieutenant Sims was uh, very lucky. And why he was lucky? He was lucky because Teddy Roosevelt, uh, at some point of time, was uh, serving in the US Navy himself. There are humors, I could not find that, but uh, I mean, the, the, I could not find the documentary proof of that, but there, 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 there is a opinions that he was serving on the battleship, he was this cannon guy. <laughs> so basically, and he was, uh, uh, I mean, his biography changing the strategy of the US Navy is a big part of his biography. So what he did, he immediately understood what it all was about. He invited this person, this person become in charge of the uh, basically innovative strategies at the US Navy. Uh, the Lieutenant Sims that we're talking about ended up to be the Admiral uh, William Sims, uh, who was uh, one of the most successful U.S. Navy ad admirals. And uh, I mean, the re results there, I mean, it's a century now, United States have never lost any single battle on the sea, any other, but on the sea especially. So, so that's the happy end story of that is that basically they took it as the equipment and everything went well. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>